I'm excited to be moderating this webinar today, sponsored by Descartes, the topic for which is strategy, strategies excuse me, to mitigate port congestion effect on your supply chain, using global trade intelligence to address shipping delays and enhance supply chain resiliency today and in the future. So as you all know, the current global shipping crisis has seen port delays increase significantly, severely impacting the top and bottom line of companies as they struggle to deliver products and raw materials to market. Structural changes in consumer buying behavior have also made port congestion and delays the norm, and many shippers and logistics providers alike are projecting the situation will continue through 2022. So thank you for joining us today to discuss how your organization can use global trade intelligence to help your shipments move more efficiently. After the presentation, we're gonna have a Q&A session. Please submit questions at any time using the tab at the bottom of your screen. We will not be using people's titles or company names. So go ahead and ask whatever you want. And if you don't see your question answered during the webinar, please be assured the Descartes team will reach out to you offline. Right, let's get to our speakers. We have three of them today. First off, we have Chris Jones. He's Executive Vice President, Industry and Services at Descartes. Chris is primarily responsible for Descartes activities and in industry best practices and implementation of Descartes solutions. He has more than 40 years of experience in the supply chain market, including the last 16 years as a part of the Descartes leadership team. Prior to the Descartes, Chris held a variety of senior management positions in other organizations. Additionally, I want to introduce Mark Segner, Vice President Global Sales at Descartes Datamine. Mark has worked in the international trade intelligence field since 2011, initially as Vice President of Sales for Zeppol, then for Datamine, before the company was acquired by Descartes. Prior to this, Mark managed manufacturing and distribution at the Knot Company, a leading supplier of industrial products where he became an expert at deploying data-driven trade strategies to achieve rapid business expansion. Finally, we have Jackson Wood. He's Director, Industry Strategy, Global Trade Intelligence at Descartes. Jackson leverages his 15 plus years of experience in market research, strategic planning, change management, and corporate development. He helps Descartes provide meaningful insights that help increase and amplify the value clients realize from Descartes solutions. Jackson joined the organization in December 2019 and brings more than two decades of trade compliance industry experience to his role. So with those introductions, I believe Chris is gonna start us off. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Chris. Great, thank you, Helen. Uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, we've got a lot to cover. We're actually gonna add some things to it based on the, the changes that have happened over the last uh, week. Uh, the subject and the things we're gonna cover are, are very uh, germane to some of the challenges I'm sure many of you are facing right now with respect to uh, Russia and Ukraine. So let's get to what we are gonna cover. One factors that are driving port congestion, uh, both uh, now and a little bit longer term. Uh, we're going to look at how uh, to analyze trade flow shifts uh, to take advantage of that, to move goods to less congested trade lanes. Um, and then lastly, and this is something that I'll just say it's never too soon to start, is to build long-term supply chain resili resiliency strategies uh, using alternative uh, sourcing. Now, Let's get into where what's got us to where we're at today. And so we've got a couple things to, to, to run through here. The chart that you're seeing is uh, analysis uh, using the Descartes uh, data mine solution of US container import volumes over the last uh, uh, three plus years. So the blue line is, uh, uh, let's call it pre-pandemic 2019, 2020 is obviously right in the throes of it. Uh, the green line is is last year, and then you can see one purple dot in there. Uh, that's the uh, January numbers. Um, and what you're really seeing here is the following: uh, is if we compare 2019 to uh, 2021, 
uh, there is almost 20% more uh, container volume coming in uh, to the US. And, uh, you know, this is, if you will, uh, with infrastructure that was probably already taxed even at that uh, 2019 level. Uh, if, as you notice, that green line, it bounces around a little bit, but it's been running roughly between uh, 2.45 million and 2.55 million uh, containers per month. Um, uh, also notice that the, and let's just focus on January for a second here. Um, uh, when you look at that, look at the gap between um, both 2019, 2020, and 2021. That again, uh, almost 20% there. But notice even that 2022 is even higher than 2021. So traditionally, many people would say that you, you get a uh, some relief after the peak season, um, but um, it definitely uh, is not looking that way. So what what's really uh, been, I'll call it the, the uh, real uh, uh, driver to um, uh, this increased volume. Uh, the first thing is st uh, strong growth uh, in demand for goods. So if you notice uh, many people, not quite everybody, but really many people have done fairly well through the pandemic. Uh, you can see that in the stock market, uh, but really overall um, uh, uh, sellers have been very strong and in fact growing. Uh, we're recovering in jobs, uh, actually is dramatically uh, fast uh, and how that's happened. Uh, just to let you know, we're almost back to pre-pandemic levels with literally in, within, uh, I think, three tenths of a percent of what was some of the lowest uh, unemployment rates ever. Um, and so uh, people have money to spend. Uh, now the question is, can they spend it on goods or services? Well, services got curtailed. All right, and that is um, uh, meant that they had a lot of money, but they couldn't spend it at restaurants or venues or international travel or anything like that. And so what's happened is they've, they've turned their attention to buying goods, uh, appliances, uh, furniture, uh, a myriad of things, just about everything you could imagine. All right, now let's add to that um, uh, the ripple effect from the production cuts at the height, height of COVID, all right? And this is actually still going on uh, as we've seen with the waves of the Omicron uh, variant. Um, that's really hurt uh, our ability to uh, get goods uh, to, to meet this demand. So we've, if you will, there's been a lot of pent up demand. Uh, anybody that's bought furniture as an example will know that uh, uh, it's taken forever, particularly if it's made uh, in Asia, uh, where it could have been a couple of months, might be nine, 10 months in some cases. So we're seeing a lot of that. All right. And then the last thing has been just the uh, disruption of the workforce. Uh, there have been quite a few people, if you've heard about the great resignation, uh, that have left the workforce and particularly um, uh, boomers uh, have gone to early retirement. So this is really uh, curtailed. I talk to uh, customers on a regular basis and we're seeing some of them at the 15 to 20% less workforce than they had uh, pre-pandemic, but oh, by the way, even more demand. So quite, quite a challenge here. Um, so what's, when we take those two big stories again, we put them together, uh, what, is it, uh, uh, what does it really mean? Well, one is the uh, basically, you know, uh, uh, vessels are just lined up for at the ports. And uh, if you look at actually some of the news that's come out recently, you know, it had been very heavily focused on West Port, uh, West Coast port delays. Uh, but even now it's happening more so on um, the East Coast. Uh, we also see uh, carriers basically, they're in control where for a number of years they were not because uh, there was way too much capacity. There's not enough capacity. So they're very much cherry picking their business. And, and uh, for instance, uh, containers are heading back to Asia uh, from the US uh, because uh, they can literally make 20, 30,000 uh, per container if they can get it back, uh, I'll call it going, um, going east uh, from uh, Asia. Um, so uh, that's also created a situation where I'll call it, uh, shippers don't have the luxury they had to move things when they wanna move them. Uh, another one that's very interesting here is that um, uh, consumer inventories are down. So if we look at things like the, uh, 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 for retailers, the inventory to sales ratio. Uh, in the past, it was around 1.5 for the last couple of years. 
bounced around a little bit. Now it's down around 1.1. And what that means is there's not enough inventory uh, to cover this demand. So we're also, if you will, seeing as part of this whole um, volume story is, is retailers trying to catch up. Uh, and, and I'm sure if uh, and as I've seen anyway, that if you talk to retailers or just about anybody, if they had more inventory, they could sell it. All right. Um, uh, manufacturing, same story here again, uh, the resources to go make it done. And then basically, as I also mentioned, you've seen uh, just you know exponential uh, growth in uh, uh, charges for um, both ocean and uh, air cargo. So we did a survey uh, not that long ago uh, to really uh, uh, talk to our customers and others in the market um, about uh, their perspective on, uh, on uh, this whole uh, global uh, shipping crisis. 55% um, of them described the bottlenecks as severe, in other words, uh, very much so impacting uh, their um, uh, business today. I think this is also very interesting is the middle one is they expect these uh, disruptions to occur for the next uh, 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 two years. Um, and uh, as we all know, shipping costs have gone through the roof and where let's say maybe folks were focused more on growth and, and less on costs. Uh, now costs are so much in the way of of uh, profitability and, and just, if you will, having the um, cash to run the business, um, that uh, this has become a big deal here. So the net of it is, if you look at all this, is that uh, people thought that maybe the pandemic, which it, what hasn't happened in terms of being a short-term thing, and that equally we would see this, you know, big issue in, in global shipping just uh, if you will, uh, go away. And if I went back a year ago, I would tell you that I had many people saying, well, you know, when we get to the uh, slow season post the holidays, uh, things will turn around. Uh, no one's saying that today. So what are the big trends to watch in uh, 2022? So as I mentioned before, this whole notion of monthly TEU import volume is a big deal. This is what you're seeing, if you will. This is like, uh, uh, this is the, the, the big symptom, all right? Um, uh, and uh, and obviously with that, because we just don't have the infrastructure, uh, uh, we're going to see wait times uh, uh, continue to be extended and also variable. Now, this is as much of an issue for, uh, uh, for importers as well. Uh, as we start looking for, I'll call it the root causes, this inventory to sales ratio is a big deal. Uh, again, until retailers start to catch up uh, to have the amount of inventory they would feel comfortable with. And by the way, that's probably more than the pandemic, uh, pre-pandemic, then that's going to really be one of the key drivers. Uh, personal expenditure on goods as opposed to services until I'll just say people are traveling internationally and uh, spending more time at restaurants or going to concerts and so forth, that they have to have alternative sources uh, uh, to, um, to spend their money uh, and given how strong our economy is. Um, obviously we've seen this whole wave effect of COVID, uh, you know, it's been, um, you know, pretty significant Omicron, I think really shocked people. And, uh, uh, you know, we've seen this, uh, whether it be here domestically or internationally really coming in waves and taking, uh, whether it's logistics or manufacturing capacity out of the, out of the equation. Uh, another one is the, uh, uh, Longshore and Warehouse uh, Workers Union uh, contract negotiations, that's underway now. Uh, it's uh, this summer, uh, it, their current contract is up. Um, things are not moving so smoothly at this point in time. That will be a huge issue uh, going forward. Certainly something that would be fantastic if it was able to work out. But if it doesn't, uh, again, it's going to really hit us from a already constrained perspective. We're going to have some challenges potentially with stoppages and slowdowns and so forth. And then the last thing here, uh, and this gets to the, you know, uh, this this past week's story and the, and this week's story, which is the the uh, uh, Russian Ukraine uh, crisis. Um, with the sanctions that are going on and so forth, uh, you know, it's going to be constricting trade, not just with those uh, countries, uh, let's say Russia in particular, uh, but also you need to think about this as an example is, 
no one's able to fly now over Russia. So if you ever thought about the movement of goods between Europe and Asia, if it's going by air, it would literally cross Russia in the past. So a lot of things will be rerouted here. Um, we're going to see some scarcity of, of, of goods, um, you know, just a really exacerbation of the situation and does not look like there's an end in sight at this point. So uh, two high level uh, approaches here we think are very important and the guys are gonna dive into this. Um, one is short-term approach. I think people have been focused on this one for a little bit uh, already uh, looking for move, uh, how to move your goods in less congested lanes. Uh, you've seen the volumes particularly on the West Coast ports, uh, LA in particular are down considerably. Uh, 20 plus percent uh, since last May as people look to try to address this issue of uh, extended wait times and so forth. Uh, uh, and this will be something that we'll see more of is, you know, again, a tactical move here. Uh, and then the, the next one is really, uh, uh, when I say longer term approach, it's longer term, not, not waiting for it to happen, but having to make it happen now, which is to look for sources um, out of these outside of these congestion lanes here, right? And uh, we think that um, uh, also putting your all your eggs in one basket, we saw this with the pandemic, uh, for instance, in China, you could have had five suppliers, but it didn't matter when they shut the country down, you lost the flexibility here. So these are big things that we think are important here, and we're going to spend a lot more time covering it. So with that in mind, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Mark Segner, who's going to talk about uh, some of the approaches here and how to think about uh, congested trade lanes and ports. Mark. Thank you, Chris. And uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. So in this section of the presentation, we'll be sharing some data pulled from the Descartes data mine application. And what we will do is analyze changes in trade flows to illustrate how we can evolve and optimize the trade lanes we are using to get shipments to their destination more efficiently, especially in light of the current challenges. We'll, we'll first start with an overview picture. This chart clearly shows why US ports are under so much pressure. As you can see, America's top 10 trading partners all registered strong growth in exports to the US in 2021. Overall import volumes rose 18% last year, with shipments from China responsible for the majority of that increase. Now let's drill down to the ports themselves. No surprise to see that overall TEU container traffic to the top 10 US ports grew strongly across the board, ranging from about 8% in Oakland to almost 29% in Houston. And from this perspective, we can see that Los Angeles was the busiest port in the US. This is interesting, but for the analysis we're doing here, we need to dig further to understand the underlying trends. When we drill deeper down into the data, this is where things become much more interesting. This is where we can see trends and patterns from which we can make informed data-driven decisions on how to best configure our supply chains. In the previous chart, we saw that for the full year of 2021, LA was the port with the biggest container volume in the US. In this chart, where volumes are tracked monthly, we can see that LA, represented by the blue line, was on top for most of 2021. But in November, its TEU volumes were hit hard we all have a good idea of what happened there. As the port of LA became increasingly congested, shippers looked for alternative ports to unload their goods. And one of the beneficiaries of that shift was the New York, New Jersey port, which overtook LA in December to become the busiest container port in the US. We can see straight away that the New York, New Jersey port isn't experiencing major backlogs because importers and carriers have successfully redirected their shipments there and the port is able to handle the additional volume. So let's expand the analysis. This chart shows the TEU volumes of the top 10 US ports for the May to August 2021 timeframe. 
and compares them against the volumes for the four month period ending January of this year. We did it that way because we wanted to show which ports were able to pick up excess capacity from the congested ports in the most recent time frame. It demonstrates that while LA was without a doubt the leading port by volume in the first part of last year, it declined significantly in the later months. The big gainers were New York, New Jersey, Savannah, Houston, Norfolk, and Charleston. If you were searching for a place to ship your shipments to, these would be the ports added to the short list. To make analysis more comprehensive, we could easily widen the scope to cover more ports. And to segue to a global perspective, you could easily undertake a similar study for international ports such as Shanghai, Singapore, Rotterdam, or Santos in Sao Paulo, Brazil. This type of analysis with quality and robust data affords importers and logistics providers with the means to undertake the necessary analysis to not only address the port congestion issue, but also adapt to other changing operating conditions in order to maintain an efficient supply chain. As a best practice, this is sometimes, this is something we should be doing periodically over time to make sure our supply chains are set up and running as optimally as possible. The pandemic has shown that disruptions can occur at any time and we should always try to be prepared for the worst. Moving along to our next section, another way to strengthen supply chain resilience is to be able to quickly source new or, or alternative suppliers. And for an introduction to that, I'll hand it over to my colleague Jackson Wood to do a little deeper dive into that side of our analysis. Jackson? Thank you very much, Mark, and <clears throat> thank you all for joining us today for a very timely and hopefully informative discussion. So we've talked a little bit about a data-driven approach to identifying perhaps more optimal trade lanes to be able to minimize the impact of delays. And what I'd like to do now is just set the stage for us to talk about the second prong of our strategy, which really is how do you go about and take practical steps towards building more long-term supply chain resiliency. And before we get into some of the specifics, I just thought I'd share a, 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 an item from the, the news that perhaps has crossed a number of your desks over the past year when President Biden initiated a strategic review of four key supply chains that were having a detrimental impact on the United States economy. The first, not surprisingly, semiconductors and any computer chips that were uh, related to a wide array of, of products from automobiles to desktop to computers to even small things like refrigerators or other appliances. The second was large capacity batteries, uh, obviously involved in electric vehicles, alternative uh, uh, energy storage strategies, rooftop solar panels, etc. We also had rare earth metals under the spotlight. Um, obviously, particularly with the backdrop of the Russia-Ukraine conflict with uh, a large uh, metals industry in that part of the world likely being affected. And the final was, this was uh, early in the, in the vaccine development process, looking at our medical supply chains as well. And I shared these examples simply to demonstrate that this has moved from something that previously perhaps was considered an academic concept around how do we think about resiliency in our supply chain to not only being a very practical issue for businesses to consider, but also now having national security and national economic considerations as well. And so we really, we really like to talk about some of the practical steps that organizations can do to strengthen their supply chain and build resiliency into their organizations. And so the first step really is doing the due diligence on your supply chain to uncover where there may be vulnerabilities. And if that is that you're overly reliant on a particular supplier or a particular jurisdiction uh, to provide core raw materials to your organization, that's probably something that you'd want to take a closer look at. But what do you do? How do you go about that? Well, taking advantage of global trade intelligence solutions like those offered by Descartes, the data mine uh, example that uh, Mark was sharing previously, you really can look at myriad of, of other supply options 
to be able to reduce some of that risk of being over-invested in one particular supplier or one particular jurisdiction. You can then do an additional level of due diligence to ensure the viability of that potential sourcing option. So whether that's looking at duty and tariff rates that may be different than your existing supplier, being able to model out different uh, examples of landed cost implications uh, for that decision. And once you're able to sort of dot in all the I's and cross all the T's from a commercial viability perspective, the last piece is performing the compliance checks to make sure that this will be a legal and sustainable business relationship going forward. And again, the, the uh, challenges that the entire global economy is facing uh, in the Russia-Ukraine conflict right now is just another example of the volatility from a regulatory perspective and the challenges that all businesses are going to face with respect to navigating sanctions and export control uh, mechanisms as they're deployed really does make this a critical uh, business capability that successful organizations are going to have going forward. Now, a lot of us might expect that these types of vulnerabilities or these types of risks are going to be concentrated in some of those industries that I mentioned previously, whether those are high tech like semiconductors, sensitive commodities like rare earth metals, et cetera. But we've seen recently that trade disruptions can happen to just about any type of product in any market for a wide variety of reasons. And so we just share here three relatively benign examples of how these types of disruptions can occur. So we first we had the US suspending the uh, imports of avocado shipments from Mexico as a result of threats coming from Mexican cartel um, and other bad actors in Mexico to port operations in the United States. So something as benign as a fruit uh, saw a very significant disruption um, very recently. Second example of is Canada halting the uh, import of medical gloves from Malaysia. Again, these uh, types, you wouldn't think that something like medical gloves would be subject to disruption, but in all of the complexity involved in the global supply chain and actors of various different motivations um, engaged in supply chains in different jurisdictions, it's very possible that perhaps your particular business hasn't experienced a disruption yet. Uh, but it's not to say that it couldn't happen for any types of reasons that are that are easy or difficult to imagine. And then finally, uh, beef imports from Canada into China and Philippines in, the, in Asia. Again, an example of where something that's a commodity that you wouldn't necessarily expect would have a lot of sensitivity or any geopolitical implications is just a, another proof point that regardless of the industry or the types of products that you're trading in, these types of disruptions can be a very real threat to the viability of your business. And so I'm at this point gonna hand it back to Mark Skinner to take us through a, a bit of a deeper dive on some examples of this and what it looked like uh, from, a, from a US perspective, we talk about furniture coming from Vietnam. Mark, back to you. Thank you, Jackson. So for the first step in our approach to effective and proven supplier sourcing, I'll illustrate with a real life example, furniture imports into the US from Vietnam. So if you were importing furniture from Vietnam last year, your supplier would have informed you around mid-year that they were going to be severely curtailing production after the Vietnamese government put the country into a lockdown to tackle a rising number of COVID cases. So the chart here is what you would have observed. Note the blue line, which is actually 2021, not uh, 2022 as uh, stated there on the chart. Um, so note the blue line represents last year's shipment volume. And as you can see, US consumers who are unable to spend their money on services such as travel and restaurants, purchased durable goods in larger quantities than before. And one of these items is furniture. So business for Vietnam's furniture manufacturers boomed in the first half of last year, but shipments subsequently went into a tailspin in the latter part of the year during the shutdown. So 
Vietnamese furniture shipments recovered at the end of the year, but volumes were significantly lower than compared to previously. So in this situation, when the shutdown was unfolding, what would have been our best next course of action? So the first step would be to research which other countries are major furniture suppliers. Here you can see that China is the biggest producer with Malaysia, Hong Kong, and Indonesia in third to fifth position after Vietnam. Here's another more visual way to see the same data. This slide shows which are the major furniture exporting countries to the US. And there might be some that you are not aware of, which opens up new possibilities and opportunities to explore. For a more in-depth analysis, you could also look at nations which are suppliers to other markets outside the US. The darker the shade of blue, the higher the volume of furniture exports to the US from this chart. You can see the biggest sources are China, India, Western Europe, Brazil, Mexico, and Canada. If your main source is Vietnam, which potentially ships to West Coast ports, you might see advantage in cultivating alternative suppliers in Latin America or Europe with trade lanes to the Gulf Coast, Coast or Eastern Seaboard. And as an alternative to Vietnam and Asia, you might think about sources in China or India. And as you drill further into the data to pinpoint manufacturers, down to company name, address, contact details, such as telephone and emails, that information is available. Let's assume at this stage that you decide to approach companies in China, India, Brazil, and Italy. The next steps involve analyzing business viability and compliance vetting to make sure the prospective manufacturer isn't on any government denied party watch list. And for these steps, I'll hand it back to Jackson who will go through some of that compliance and supplier vetting process for us. Jackson. Thanks very much, Mark. And I think just before we get into some of the specifics around looking at landed cost implications or compliance, I think this is a great example of a truism perhaps many of us have heard that the most dangerous words in any business are, well, we've always done things this way. And I think a lot of organizations do fall into a little bit of a, of a complacency trap, particularly where, hey, this is a critical supplier. We have a very long-standing relationship with them. We don't necessarily want to rock the boat or cause any friction in that by thinking about whether there might be other options available to us. But I think what the pandemic, the ongoing challenges we're seeing from a geopolitical perspective is really moving this into a almost a mandatory state for organizations to be thinking about the practical steps that can be taken to build more resiliency into the supply chains. And so what Mark just demonstrated to us is just one example of the power that's embedded in global trade intelligence solutions like our data mine platform that allow you to very quickly find alternative supply options. But now the question becomes, are these going to be viable options? And so we'll start with the, the commercial considerations around duty rates. So we talked a little bit about what some of the other countries um, might be that you could consider sourcing from. Yet when we look at the duty rates associated across the entire spectrum of options, we see that one, China is far less favorable to us from a, a commercial perspective than the others. And this is a, another example of that very intimate intersection of commerce and geopolitical actions because this very high duty rate on China as an example is a result of the tariff uh, regime that was imposed by previous leadership in the United States really trying to challenge uh, China's role in the global economy. And that is a direct result of political considerations and so this is a direct manifestation of how those types of events can have a very practical day-to-day -day impact on those of us trying to run effective supply chains. So being able to do this type of side-by-side -side analysis very quickly helps you get a sense of that initial dimension of viability, which is tariff rates or duty implications. 
Taking it one step farther, however, and utilizing a solution like our uh, Descartes Customs Info platform allows you to do much deeper analysis on the full breadth of landed cost considerations. So, of course, duty and tariff is, is one element of that, but there are also insurance, transportation, other considerations that go into that uh, calculation. And if you look at this example that we're showing here, when we see Vietnam on the left and China on the right, you can see highlighted in the bottom the very significant difference in the total landed costs of choosing one country over the other. And so this hopefully gives you some sense that, as I mentioned previously, this is something that's very practical and very doable for organizations to lean into and embrace the opportunity to build more resiliency into their supply chains. Because not only is it easier than ever to find alternative sourcing options, it's also easier to do your commercial due diligence to ensure that that actually is a viable resiliency strategy for your organization. But beyond the commercial viability, we also have to think about things from a regulatory and a legal perspective. And so this is where being able to leverage a, 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 a full suite of global trade intelligence solutions like those offered by Descartes are so critical because now you're also able to do any vetting for restrictions, sanctions, or any kind of embargoes or debarments for a company that you may consider as a new option for uh, your supply chain being able to ensure that there aren't restrictions on that entity or on that country as an example is absolutely critical because it may be a good supplier in terms of the quality of the product, the volume. It may make sense from a landed cost perspective, but if there are regulatory impediments to your ability to do business with that institution, then that's obviously not something that you would want to pursue any farther. So what we can see here is just a a sample image from our visual compliance platform that really is a, a, a top to bottom, front to end decision support tool that allows organizations to do their due diligence from a regulatory perspective. So you can see on the top box there that we've put the company name into the search as well as the country, China. And here we can see that there are no results that are coming back. So this is a, a, a green flag that this is uh, proven to be a viable option for us in terms of considering that uh, from a legal and a regulatory perspective. And the other benefit that we have here, particularly with the backdrop of the escalating volatility from a geopolitical perspective, is we have now papered the file, so to speak, and we are able to demonstrate that we have done our regulatory due diligence as we consider alternatives uh, to building resiliency into our supply chain. So to just try to bring everything together, we've covered a lot of material here, a lot of different considerations. I think the, the key takeaways that we would like everybody to leave our discussion today is, one, this, as I've, as I've mentioned, has moved beyond the conceptual, the academic to a very practical set of steps that organizations can take, not only in the short term to reduce the, the, their dependence perhaps on very congested ports and being able to find alternative avenues to getting products into the country, but also from a long-term perspective in terms of being able to take some repeatable and proven steps to build greater resiliency into your supply chains. And with that, I will now hand things back to Helen to facilitate us through the question and answer session. Thank you so much to Chris, Mark and Jackson. That was a very interesting presentation. I think we really get the message that we need to take a longer term, well-informed view of how to get around these supply chain interruptions. Um, now we'll get to some questions from the audience. Once again, please submit your questions using the tab at the bottom of your screen. We won't be using people's titles or company names, so you should feel free to ask whatever you want. If you don't see your question answered during the webinar, please be assured the Descartes team will reach out to you offline. So I'd like to start off with, with my own question from watching your presentation. Uh, and, and this is for all three of you, um, but I'll start with Chris. 
will our supply chains ever get back to normal like it was before COVID? Chris, what do you think? I think I should go off mute. Um, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I don't, I, back to what it was before, it's, it's really unlikely. A um, couple of factors, uh, one is, uh, people's buying habits have changed with, I won't go into all the details there, but uh, we've done some actually some studies in the e-commerce space and uh, you know, e-commerce is, I'm sure as everybody knows, uh, uh, volumes have gone way up, but uh, buyers, particularly older buyers are actually buying more online. They were really probably the bigger drivers. So these things are gonna, and a lot of that stuff is sourced internationally. So long story short, don't expect, uh, um, May may see a slowdown, uh, but you know, as as um, people spend uh, on services, but uh, I don't think we'll see what we saw in the past. Right. What about you, Mark? What do you think? Uh, I'd have to uh, concur with Chris. You know, based on the continued and sustained increases in imports that we've seen over the last three years. Um, there's just nothing to indicate that we're going to see that lesson. Um, you know, there, there may be some slight changes to buying habits as the economy opens up a bit and we start spending a little more on services, but we still see this being a sustained increase on top of the many interruptions to supply chains that we've been seeing over the years. You know, maybe it started with tariffs years ago and a number of climate and weather events. COVID, you know, what's next? I mean, there's always something that's going to be disrupting supply chains and we need to do whatever we can to uh, add some of that resilience back into our supply chains. Right. Um, and, and Jackson, that's a very sensible, Mark. Thank you. Jackson, what, would you, what do you have to add to that? Well, I think speaking primarily from a regulatory risk management due diligence perspective, I don't think we'll ever get to a point where the burdens that have presented themselves in the last two years go away. In fact, I think they're going to increase, even if we're able to iron out a lot of the challenges and the points of friction in the physical movement of goods. I think the expectation of global organizations to know at a very granular level of detail who they're mm -hmm. doing business with and not only the company and the country it's located in but the ownership structure of the company contractors that are associated with the company the burden of that due diligence i think is only going to increase um, going forward and and actually jackson i don't want to put you on the spot but i just saw a couple of days ago that there were i think there was an eu directive with a new uh corporate due diligence uh, yeah. requirement that goes drills really deep down into the supply chain into many tiers down in suppliers so that's yeah. obviously presents some challenges right we could do a whole next webinar on esg concerns right like what are sure. organizations actually doing and what are the expectations in terms of what organizations are going to have to do from an environmental social and governance perspective so the, the regulation that you're referring to is, in fact, a pretty big move by the European Union to move ESG from a nice to have to a required level of, of due diligence. And we're seeing similar actions starting to happen in the United States. We know the SEC is starting to signal uh, some policy uh, prototypes that are going to be required for publicly traded companies to do explicit due diligence from an ESG perspective. And there's also just one other example in New York state, there are some state level actions that are likely to impact the fashion industry around the required due diligence will be required for those businesses. Uh, right. So I, I do think there's going to be more of these requirements going forward, not less. Let's do that webinar. <laughs> uh, fantastic. So I'm getting some audience questions in here. Uh, this one is for Mark. Um, you presented a lot of data. Where is this source from and how up to date is it in your system? Sure. So we source our data from customs agencies and, and trade ministries around the world. And the update frequency varies based on the country. 
but our most important is the United States bill of lading data set. And that is updated daily with only a one day delay after receiving the information from US Customs and Border Protection. So um, the data you look at within our interface for the US only has a one to two day delay from when uh, Customs clears a shipment, so very current. That's amazing. When you think even 10 years ago, that would have been almost unthinkable. Yeah, for sure. Incredible. Thank you, Mark. Um, I have another question here. This is for Chris. Um, can you go over the trends to watch again? Sure. There's uh, really, I'll just say there's uh, two uh, macroeconomic ones that that uh, we're following. Uh, the, the first one is, uh, I'll call it the, uh, and, and these are things, by the way, you can get them off uh, uh, fed, uh, fed data, and we're actually doing a monthly report on, uh, but simply put, they're looking at the ratio of uh, goods ex expenditures to um, services. Um, so if that line, if you will, continues to stay up, then that's putting that's what's putting all the pressure on, uh, you know, bringing things into the country. Uh, that, that's one of the big ones. The second one is this uh, retail um, uh, inventory to sales. Uh, everybody, this is an easy one for you to see it. But again, the data is out there, but you'll see it when you go to the store and the shelves. If the shelves are not full, which is just about everywhere, then you can see that the retailers have not caught up. And then lastly where the whole port congestion, port delay piece comes in, and, and this is the effect uh, of the two that I just mentioned, is going to be this uh, container import uh, volumes. Um, if, there, if we're running between 2.45 and two, uh, let's say north of 2.4 is the easiest way to look at this, uh, every month or close to every month, that, that's the kind of pressure that's got the big backups and congestions at the ports and everything else like that. Wow, okay. Thank you, that's great, that's very uh, concise. Um, I have another question here, uh, this is for Jackson. Our company business is in countries not under sanctions and embargoes. Do I still need the de denied party screening step? It's a, it's a good question and I think unfortunately the answer is pretty explicit and that it's yes. Um, <laughs> and there are, you know, we've, we've done other webinars where we try to debunk some of these myths that, hey, I'm not in a sensitive industry like aerospace and defense, or I'm not involved in any sensitive technology, screening doesn't apply to me. Um, and I think we've provided a few examples in the webinar around restrictions or regulatory impacts on very inert products like food or like medical supplies. Uh, but you'd be surprised how uh, vast an array of individuals or companies are restricted, debarred, or sanctioned by governments around the world. We have one visual that we've used that just shows the disbursement of, mm -hmm. of restricted individuals, and they are resi resident in Canada, they're resident in the United mm -hmm. States, they're resident in South America, Central America, countries in Europe, et cetera. So our recommendation is always to in any of these types of situations, more caution, more due diligence is likely to be the right decision for your business, simply from a risk management perspective. Right, we're gonna be adding a lot of Russians to those lists uh, in the near future, it looks like. Um, and I sorry if I could, sure. I just add one point to that, Helen, you had asked, uh, there would have been a question to Mark about the, um, the timeliness of some of the data that he had shared. And I just want to echo on the sort of the regulatory side in terms of some of the things that I talked about, whether it's on the, the duty, the landed cost, or the compliance side, we update that information just as frequently. So particularly now with all of the new sanctions that are being published as a result of the Russia-Ukraine situation, our content experts are working overtime to make sure that our customers have access to the most timely and the most accurate regulatory information so that they can make the most informed compliance decisions for their business. That's fantastic. Thank you, Jackson. Um, I just have uh, one more uh, question from the audience. Um, trade data is often very lumpy from one month to the next. I think this is one for you, Mark. Um, can you explain why that is and how many monthly data points do you consider before concluding there is a trend? Sure. 
Um, it, it certainly is lumpy and there's a number of factors there that are related to perhaps infrastructure and capacity availability, but also the, the kind of overarching uh, thing that, that contributes to the lumpiness is the holiday season and the shopping that happens in the US and consumption for, for that holiday season. So that's the single greatest driver to seasonability of imports. Um, regarding the, the second part of the question, hmm. you know, there's um, a number of data points that we look at, but the majority that we use for determining trends are maritime imports into the US, which account for about 90% of the merchandise imports coming into the US. So it accounts for the lion's share of, of what comes in. So we feel that's the single greatest barometer to use. And when you look at that over, as we do many months and years, you get a pretty good picture of what that trend looks like. Right, right, good, thank you. Okay, um, and I have a, a, a wrap up question and I think this is, um, from uh, for Jackson, um, so that you know the, the results of the survey were, were obviously very interesting. Um, from a business perspective, and this is a big question: What have we learned from COVID? Well, I mean, I think we've learned a couple of things on the negative side of the ledger, but I'd also say we've learned some things on on the positive side of the ledger. So, from a from a very negative perspective unfortunately we've learned that we live in a volatile world where the quote unquote black swan events those things that we really perhaps academically knew were possible but there was no way would ever happen actually happen um, and that as our world becomes more interconnected as information flows uh, more quickly and in more many different directions that volatility is only going to increase so un unfortunately we've learned that there are real risks to our businesses out there but what on the positive side is there are things we can do today to make our business more resilient and that's not just from a supply chain perspective but it's also from a due diligence perspective it's from a modeling and a strategic planning perspective so I'm an optimist by nature. I try to focus on the positives. So if I could just leave everyone with what we've talked about today are very practical steps you can take to build more resiliency into your business. It's not hard to get started to, you know, the mindset shift required inside your organization perhaps will be the biggest challenge to overcome, but from an access to information from our, our ability to slice and dice this information to generate hyper-local insights for organizations, it's all possible. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to try to maintain that optimistic outlook and recognize that there are things we can do today to build a more resilient business for the future. That's a very positive note to end on. Thank you, Jackson. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much to Chris, Mark and Jackson from Descartes. And as a special thanks to all of you for participating. I think we've learned a lot about how global, global trade intelligence can enhance supply chain resiliency, which is something we all want. Um, we had a lot of questions today and I'm afraid we didn't get to all of them. Um, we'll be answering the ones we didn't get to with you offline. So stand by for that. You're also, as soon as you sign off, you're going to see a quick one minute survey after you log off, please complete it. And then you're also going to get an email later from Descartes with a link so you can view the webinar on demand or share it with friends. And that will also include the survey. So thank you again for your participation. Thanks to our fantastic speakers. Stay safe, stay happy and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.